call the um, regional school committee to order. Tonight we have two meetings happening and we have more people I think than we probably ever had before. Um, love seeing all these people here. And uh, so I'm going to briefly talk about the format for tonight. Um, our first meeting, meeting is the regional school committee meeting, which we have just called to order. And that agenda will have public comment. At the end of that public comment period, I will call that meeting to a close and we will open the public hearing on the budget. Um, at the public hearing on the budget, that's an opportunity for anyone here in the public to ask questions about the finances. Um, we will then, at the end of that, close that public hearing and reopen the regional school committee meeting where we will have an additional discussion about details on the budget and a few other agenda items. For those who have never been to a school committee meeting before, um, public comment, you stand, say your name um, for teachers, say your affiliation, which school you're from. We sort of ask that you spend maybe two to three minutes um, on whatever it is you would like to discuss. And if someone else is following you and feels that they have the same comments to make, we ask that you sort of keep that brief and say, I agree with Renee, Keith, Laura, whoever's saying it. Um, so with that said, I will um, call for public comment and ask if we have any tonight. Okay. <laughs> sure, I'll go first. <clears throat> Members of the school committee, superintendent, fellow educators, about 150 of you, taxpayers. <laughs> Taxpayers, students watching at home, and other members of the community. I'm Keith Valentine Kaplan, president of the DSEA and a history teacher at the high school. I'm here with my colleagues today to share with you what is going on as we bargain for a new contract for the more than 200 members of our local union. I'm going to be concise. This is an overview of what is going on. I'm leaving the bulk of our remarks, about 10 minutes total, to colleagues who will each briefly share with you their stories. For us, the number one job and the number one concern is to provide to provide the highest quality education for our students. The people here with me work extremely hard doing that, investing the hours it takes, <laughs> <laughs> investing the hours it takes outside of the school day to make sure that our students are prepared for what they will face when they leave here. Our results, the students that we graduate, prove that our efforts are successful. To continue to do this, our schools need to continue to attract and retain the best teachers by offering pay and benefits that are on par with those of other high achieving districts. In recent contract negotiations, we have collaborated with elected officials to do just that. With little or no publicity, we have negotiated collaboratively, considering the pay and benefit packages of the districts with which both school committee members and we compare ourselves. The issue is that under the current contract, our projected earnings over a typical career are now over $100,000 less than many of our comparable districts. To us, the path forward is clear. We need to increase our pay over the next three years at a rate greater than our comparable districts are increasing their pay. Accordingly, we have looked at the increases recently negotiated in other districts. They are, on average, increasing around 2% per year. We have proposed increases over the next three years of 3%, 3%, and 3.25%, bringing us closer to where we think we belong, given quantitative considerations, such as our school's rankings, and things that are harder to measure. School committee members have proposed salary increases less than those of the increases already agreed to by our comp districts. We are here because we want the public to know how things are going and why we think that they are not yet going well. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, well, hello, and thank you for allowing me to speak. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Renee Barron, Renee Grady. Oh, I changed my name. <laughs> um, I worked at the um, Dover School Systems for over 17 years. Prior to that, I was in business. I've taught first grade, I've taught third grade, and now I live in fourth grade at the Chickering. Um, I have to say teaching in Dover has been wonderful. Over this time, I've developed lifelong connections with families and children that I know that I've impacted not only their education, but who they are and who they'll grow up to be. So what am I here to talk about? Something that all of us in here are asking for. Contract increases that will bring our salaries closer to those in comparable towns. That's what we're looking for. In figuring out to say, I kind of thought about a lesson plan and thought of my audience, and I decided that maybe the best way to illustrate my point was maybe to talk by comparing schools with businesses. So as we all know, teachers don't deal with widgets. We deal with children. Our successes aren't measured in dollars. While some say they're measured in test scores and house values, we know it's not. That. It's more about the child in front of us. Not only their academic growth, but their ability to navigate the world socially and emotionally. When a school is ranked as number one, like Dover Sherman often is, it doesn't come with an influx of cash that increases our budget and translates into quality bonuses or promotions. Raises aren't calculated based on profits. They're based on budgets. And because of previous and future budget constraints, we now have a problem. Like Keith mentioned, Dover and Sherburn salaries are, comp are behind comparable school districts like Wellesley, Whalen, Concord Carlisle, Weston, and Weston again. <laughs> In the past six years, they have surpassed us is really where we are. So what we're asking for from you now is a fair and equitable contract, like our competitors have received. It doesn't seem It doesn't seem exorbitant. It seems um, fair and well deserved. So I ask that you all encourage your members of your negotiation team to make decisions that respect and support teachers. This is overwhelming. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Carol Spisano, and I'm a guidance counselor in my ninth year at Dover Sherman High School. First, let me say, and I know I speak for my colleagues, about how proud I am to say that I work for Dover Sherburn, Dover Sherburn Schools. No matter where I go, whenever I'm asked where I work, I always smile before I respond, because I know that inevitably, the response when I say Dover Sherburn High School is always the same. It's, wow, really? What an amazing school system. And of course, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I know firsthand what a great school system it is. One of the best, if not the best, in Massachusetts. But of course, we are biased. Um, I, like Renee, didn't start out in education. I worked in business for about 15 years. So I didn't know very much about public education, except for what I'd heard. Short days, summer's off, this looks like a good gig. <laughs> While we do have a shorter year than some, I can assure you that from the moment we walk in in the morning, it's go time and we are on. Period after period, hour after hour, and well beyond the bell, teachers are working diligently. <coughs> and trying to think in business terms also like Renee, I liken a day of teaching to giving four and five presentations a day, maybe hour after hour, um, perhaps on topics that are not the same time after time, and to an audience that ranges from our really strongest students to our most challenging learners and everything in between. <laughs> trying to keep that group engaged and inspired day after day and hour after hour, it's pretty intense. Um, every day is intense, and because we're working with kids, you never really know what you're going to get, but you need to be ready for anything and everything. So I think we all feel like we are teachers, coaches, mentors, mediators, advisors, role models, friends, advocates, and cheerleaders. consider ourselves to be very fortunate that we work for Dover Sherborne Schools because we have amazing <coughs> students who we genuinely adore and we have wonderfully supportive parents and that's important. So that's why it's hard to enter into negotiations and have these discussions about compensation and other contract items. It's uncomfortable for many of us to talk about compensation, especially with people who are not our direct supervisors who may not really know what we do and not often know how well that some of us really do it. But here we are. So instead of repeating what Renee and uh, Keith have already shared, the bottom line is that right now we aren't comparable. We have fallen behind, and it will only worsen if it's not addressed. 
So we hope that we can count on your support to get D DS back to the place where we all feel it really belongs. and I'm, I'm in my 15th year of teaching social studies at the high school. And I'm in fact a product of the dover Sherburn educational community. I grew up in Sherburn. I attended Pine Hill School from first grade onward, attended what was then known as the junior high, and I attended and graduated from the high school. I've heard it said before that people who go into teaching are oftentimes people who loved being students and who are looking for a way to extend the educational experience into their professions. And I really do think for myself this is true. And I know for myself that my love of learning and my love of education started here in these schools and was shaped by the amazing group of teachers I had over the years. And since I've started as a teacher at DS, I've actually been privileged to work alongside many of these very same teachers. And although in the 15 years that have passed, many of those teachers have retired, I still actually do get to work with a few of them. <laughs> um, DS teachers exemplify professionalism. They're experts in their subject matter, and they know how to deliver it to students in a way that inspires. We are de dedicated to our classes, and we know our students as individuals. And the dover Sherburn community is one that's really built around the shared value of respect. And it's respect for the whole learning process that comes through in respect that's shown between teachers and students, respect amongst the staff. And this modeled respect, and respect encourages genuine respect between students. And then there's, of course, the respect that's felt both ways between the teachers and the community. And I remember being a first year teacher and this was a time when I felt as though I was barely keeping my head above water. And the end of every day came with this immense sense of accomplishment and relief. Um, and then the inevitable accompanying sense of almost dread when I realized I had to do it all over again. The next day, before 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, I remember really being struck by uh, my more experienced colleagues who weren't having to work like I was just to stay afloat but who were working extremely hard at honing their craft. They were developing new curriculum, they were finding new ways to engage and inspire students, and they were making and keeping the learning really relevant. And these teachers provided an example to which I could aspire, and they also showed me exactly what it meant to devote a lifetime career to being a teacher at DS. And they also showed me just why my time here as a student had been so very special. In the last six years, I've been disappointed at the handling of the salary matrix, and for me personally, this coincided with a time in my life when I was planning for the costs associated with a new family, with home ownership, for building upon that family. But I was also really concerned at the fact that the colleagues I had who were in the latter part of their careers were effectively seeing their real income stagnate and even potentially fall because they hadn't received an adequate cost of living increase. So today, I'm wearing red in support of all these teachers that I'm proud to be, you know, on the staff with. And I'm also asking for your support as we negotiate our next contract, a contract that we really feel needs to provide a decent cost of living raise for all teachers and a salary matrix that recognizes and respects the outstanding caliber of teacher that's always been drawn to DS and that's helped to make DS the great place it is. of um, the regional school committee and even the school committee members who are negotiating who aren't here this evening because they're not on the region um, I want to thank all of you wholeheartedly for coming tonight um, I think all of us appreciate hearing what you had to say and seeing everyone who's here tonight um, we are working diligently um, to come to a mutually agreed contract and we look forward to our next um, negotiation which is Thursday evening in this room <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for coming and we'll see you Thursday thank you. Thank you.
Regional School Committee to a close for the moment and open the public hearing. Um, I might go stand over there just to use this um, protector as we have Do you want me no to audience. Through? Do you want us to pull the table back? Um, no, 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 no. It's right. I'm going right behind the stone. Oh, no. No, why don't you stand oh, up there? I'll click. No problem. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, I think it's just on the arrow. That's blurred. Yep. Both hands, they start to snore. You hold my hands. Both hands start to snore. <laughs> so no peanut gallery down that side? <laughs> um, so tonight is the public hearing on the FY18 regional budget. And before I get started, um, I wanted to say a wholehearted thanks to Mr. McCullough, Ms. Victoria, the administrative team, school committee members who um, have spent numerous hours um, thinking about it, discussing about it, um, drawing conclusions, reshaping those conclusions that allowed us to get to a budget um, this evening. And to remind everyone of our mission, I think the teachers who were just here earlier spoke to this about the Dover Sherbourne Schools share in the mission to inspire, challenge, and support all students as they discover and pursue their full potential. As we pulled together um, the budget, we focused on and needed to review and revise educational services as appropriate. We needed to evaluate and maintain our facilities. We need to remain fiscally responsible and mindful of the financial constraints in which we find ourselves, um, whether that's federal or state funds, um, funds that come from both of the towns support to support the district. Um, as always, we need to comply with federal and state mandates, and we need to fund contractual obligations. We had guidance from both Dover and Sherburn. Uh, Dover's guidance is, uh, can be summed up as level services, and Sherburn's guidance is level funded with a reserve for new initiatives and health care. I will make a side note that um, both towns and the selectmen in Sherburne, I believe, have voted no override. So there is no appetite in either district for an override. This year, as we uh, look at the final numbers that we'll see shortly, we looked at what's driving the increase of our um, FY18 budget. Our enrollment remains constant for the foreseeable future. Health care and related benefits make up 50% of the FY18 increase, and the balance being collective bargaining and contractual obligations. In FY18, we're seeing some new and needed educational services that are based on our student population. The first of those being a life skills program to support students using an in-district model. Those are those students who are high school age to age 22. 
that program will need one additional special education teacher. The language-based program that has been running at the middle school and the high school, we will need an additional special ed language-based teacher at the high school to follow some of our students to the high school and um, support the number of students in that building. We will also be um, sharing a behavior, a board certified behavior analyst with the Dover and Sherburn districts and that person will be a point one FTE at the region. Again, aligning service delivery and um, supporting IEPs. This coming year, we hope to implement a transition program to support students uh, <coughs> be re-entering school after a prolonged absence. We, at our January meeting, we listened to um, a presentation about that program and an estimate that um, over the course of the year, probably about 10% of our population could make use of this program next year. The costs associated with that, many will be picked up by a grant um, or community support. There will be an additional education assistant that's in the numbers you see on the next slide. So as we look at the uh, regional schools FY18 budget and um, ensuing statutory assessment, you'll note that um, in FY18, the operating balance of $20,149,466 is a 4.58% increase over the previous year. When you look at the debt, uh, you'll see that overall that's going down 9.93%. And we will be using um, $199,000 of our FY17 funds to pay off the last year of the bans at the region. And, and that um, is going to pay for the um, air conditioning that was done here at the middle school and uh, capital items. So the end result is a 3% increase in the assessments um, and as you can see Dover's assessment will go up 4.35% and Sherburn's 1.5% and for those um, listening who aren't here that assessment is a formula and part of that is based on the number of students in your town attending the regional campus. We're providing everyone with the information on revenue projections. Um, our revenue will include in the FY18 budget $137,290, which is additional Chapter 70 money that we received in FY17 after the time that we set the budget. So that will be um, used to offset our expenses. FY18, um, like our previous years, we've used the on-site insight report to um, come up with what capital items need to be repaired, maintained, addressed in the upcoming year. You'll see that that total is 364,000 and includes things like ADA compliant doors, uh, locker room laboratory, waste line, um, uh, concrete repairs, and other items around the regional campus. These items are being funded by an intermissible agreement between Dover and Sherburn, as we have in the last <coughs> few years as well. We also like to note that uh, the community investment we've accepted here at, at the Regional School Committee many gifts this year from Boosters, DSEF, FOPA, Positive, PTO, the Mudge Foundation, Needham Bank, private donations, um, smaller company donations, and um, as always, we are ever grateful <coughs> for that additional support for our school district. <coughs> and that is the brief overview of the operating uh, and capital budgets of the region. And do we have any public comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. 
and reopen the regional school committee, um, which uh, is the IMA. So you received in your packet, um, or or actually in the packet for the February 9th, which actually became the February 15th meeting uh, meeting day. You received copies of the intermunicipal agreement for FY18, along with copies of the memos that were sent to both uh, boards of selectmen. Both boards of selectmen have uh, approved and uh, signed off on the FY18 IMA. Uh, the Dover selectmen did so on February 2nd. The Sherburn board did so on February 23rd. So what is being asked of the committee uh, tonight is to uh, approve the intergovernmental agreement for FY18 and we do have we can do this uh, right at the end of the meeting we have uh, three copies of, that are originals that we would ask you to sign and then uh, they'll be executed we'll execute them by sending them back to the two communities the committee has been through this this is year four of uh, this this uh, process, so I think everyone is familiar with how that works. So we don't have to vote anything, or do we vote to accept it? Yes. Okay. So I'll invite a motion to accept the um, intergovernmental agreement as submitted in your packet. Um, and we don't have Carolyn, so can someone just? Dana, do you mind just noting that, the, the oh, motion? Yeah. Yep. So Richard, I mean, right forward. Yep. Amy will get it. Oh, Amy will get it off the table. No problem, just in case. Yep. Um, those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, would you like to? I will. Thank you. Uh, next item is a discussion and vote to certify the FY18 operating budget. Um, as you all know, uh, we've been working on this budget, uh, both at the administrative level and at the school committee level, uh, for a number of months now. Uh, the, the budget that was presented tonight in, in the public hearing is the uh, budget uh, reflects the budget uh, adjustments and uh, discussion that occurred at our last meeting. And uh, I think that uh, just a couple of things I wanted to just add is that, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of something else. I, I think I'm, I'm good. I'm, I, I, I think it's time for you to have discussion and opportunity to ask questions and make comments. I do have one. Um, on the, the Bright program, um, I know that this year it's cheap and it becomes more expensive for us as, as we go on. Um, and school committee obviously has, has um, recognized that in our discussions. I don't think there's anything else in the budget that has that uh, future cost associated with it. Am I right that this is the only thing we're adding that is cheap this year, but it's going to get more expensive as we run? You are correct. Okay. And in your packet you received, I think, go one more page. Right now it's in the Yeah, yeah. 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 And so the way that the, this one, thank you. The way that we intend to apply for the grant, which, by the way, the grant application process is now open. Deadline for submitting applications is March 29th. Correct, I believe, and uh, we will we would expect to have an answer uh, by uh, sometime late April early May. That's what we're being told. Uh, Ellen will be attending a uh, 
a uh, workshop that Metro West uh, Health provides uh, for those who intend to write a grant. What you see on the projection is, uh, again, an incremental cost to fully fund over the next uh, four years. Any other questions? Michael? On the, um, back to like the fifth or sixth slide around the expansion of, of staffing in the special education area. Is that, um, at a summary level, how, is that gonna bring, again, students who are already out of district back in from either of the two towns' budgets? Um, is it to support students who are transitioning up from grade five? What's what's the mix there? So I think it's a it's a, a mix of all of those, uh, and I'll I'll briefly comment, and then uh, Chris, you can expand on that. Uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, learning based program, uh, we are projecting. Uh, if, there's a language based, language and there's based. A the language based okay. program uh, uh, that's a program that's been in place now for about four years we have had we have had students come into that program from our elementary schools uh, initially when it was first created there were some uh, there were there were I forget the exact number three or four yeah, two, 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 two students that Sherwin. came back from Sherwin as we started that program the program has grown to the point where uh, we have one teacher who and two educational assistants who are servicing uh, the students between both middle school and high school. Uh, we'll have a bug and even split next year between middle school and high school students. And in order to, uh, to provide really the services at the high school level that we really need to provide, uh, uh, the, the proposal would call for the additional teacher in the program to to be uh, housed in each of the two buildings. So one at the middle school, one at the high school. Uh, we we uh, that's to support the existing census, and that's not going to impact any potential um, existing out of district placements. Maybe. Well, it might, and uh, part of the. Uh, Part of the challenge in expanding and creating these positions is uh, sometimes you have there, there are students available who will enter these programs <laughs> sometimes you need to create them and have yeah. them in place a field of dreams mm -hmm. scenario yes yeah, so 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 people will will create will will uh, take that opportunity for the life skills program uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the the life skills program we we have a teacher in place at the middle school and by creating this program at the high school I think it's fair to say that there's a very very high percentage that there will be at least one student who will be returning to the district but uh, this family is actually waiting to see if in fact the program will be created so uh, so we feel pretty good about that. Do we have any students that are in district that will be uh, transitioning from the middle school up to the high school that also be? Not for next year, but we have we have, the, we have that middle school student who will transition in two years into the high school, and we uh, we are optimistic that um, we'll see the same kind of movement from the elementary schools into the middle school program. The life skills program is not a program that will see the kinds of numbers eventually that the language based program will be because it is more of a low incident program. But uh, certainly over time, um, you know, in places where I've been, I would tell you that in Winchester High School, the last year I was there, we had probably eight students, maybe even nine. In the high school life skills program, uh, at the middle school we had uh, a similar number. Do those students end up in kind of a partial 
um, inclusion environment or are they substantially separate? I'll let Chris respond to that. They, those partic these particular students that we're um, projecting for the life skills program are really students who will not be earning a high school diploma, so their inclusion opportunities may be more related to elective classes, um, the social environment of the high school, um, and then they may, uh, an individual student may audit a class for the participation or the experience at a different level, okay. but not for the um, academic rigor of the classes. Okay. Um, do we have other budget questions? Yeah, I have an informational question. <laughs> with regard to the life skills program, I'm, I'm wondering, um, very often an expensive placement will be what I assume may be that type of education for post-12 grade students, and I'm wondering if there's any thought or consideration to perhaps filling some of those post So the, um, the transition program from 18 to 22 is often dramatically different from the, the experience of a high school mm -hmm. uh, that we currently are operating under, right. so the 9th through 12th grade experience. Um, the students who need the transition program from 18 to 22 need a lot of community-based experiences. Mm -hmm. So the benefit to creating the life skills program at the high school is that when those when these students age into that realm, we will um, have them in our community so that their transition experiences become community-based transition experiences. So I foresee the students staying in our community, but us needing um, perhaps a contract with a job coach or a contract with um, one of our tech collaboratives to bring in some of the expertise that we would need around that level of programming. Um, it's a lot of um, it's a lot of work-based, community-based experiences that build that rich experience of transition for kids. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just curious. Sure, I mean, sure. You know, so, we, so conceptually, though, that that is the intent absolutely. of this program, right. is to right. keep the students post grade 12 here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and not having them go to an outside right. yeah. placement to receive the transition services. And, and that's realistic in a community that has <coughs> so few of the normal things that most communities have, right, you know, next door to their schools. I, 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 mean, I, I, think, I mean, we're just so remote from job and, and internship or those types of right. experiences. I, it, it, it would be, uh, we would be reaching out not just to the Dover Sherborne community, mm -hmm. but certainly to the the contiguous community. So, so there are there certainly are opportunities in Natick. There are certainly opportunities in Wellesley, in Needham, and okay, Westwood. So yeah. It's harder to picture that than sure. Natick no, no, or I, I understand that. Yeah. Um, yep. or, you know, Westwood. Yep. I mean, if I if may, may yes. I, one of the things that students at that age range are doing are are travel training. Well, we don't have a bus system or and in, in available to our area, but we would still be teaching our students to access a shared ride and then and get to a certain area within our community. Um, so when you're in district, you're actually doing that work in your district, mm -hmm. which is yeah. really rich for families and kids. Thank you, Kristen. Any other budget questions? <laughs> so next would be a motion to certify the FY18 budget, correct? Yes. Um, and I will read that motion out as a reminder. This is um, part of the regional agreement that we do it now. And um, as we say, it's the high water mark. If we make changes in our budget, it would be to a downward number. Mm -hmm. Actually, can I stop for a second? 
So um, given that, uh, given that the, the Bright program is budgeted based on receipt of a grant, grant what happens to our budget and this high water mark if we don't get the grant? So that, that what, what I would think would happen is um, a, a couple of things would happen. If we hear prior to town meeting that we did not receive the grant, then we could there could be a motion at town meeting to reduce the budget by the amount of the educational assistance. Uh, if, if we don't hear until after that, what, I didn't understand that. We would reduce not it by that program. amount. So the program well, wouldn't have. Well, that would I be. That's the first. Yeah, right? that would be one option. Okay. Yeah. The the other option, which I think is the more realistic op option, is that the budget stays at the level that was voted, but we do not. We just won't fill that EA position, and ultimately that money goes back, you know, to the to the two communities through you know, at some point at the end of the year. Your, your assumption in both of those scenarios is that the program doesn't happen if we don't get the grant. Just want to make sure that I, that I think, correct. yeah, we've well, talked about that. I think that's what we said. Absolutely. Yeah. And the way that this budget structured, 80,000 of spending is not in this budget, correct? It's off correct. in some old grant account? Correct. Okay. Like a number of other grants. So, so, the, that, we, so the, that grant revenue is not projected into our revenue mm -hmm. line for what budget we're voting on now. It is not. Okay. It is not. And the regional committee will certainly accept the grant. You will have to when vote it. to accept the grant if, in fact, you get it. I don't <coughs> think that that will impact the budget. That that grant would be part of a separate fund, right? And would right. fund It'd be like title one money. Yes. Yep. Correct. Okay. So the motion is <coughs> the 2017-18 budget in the amount. The motion is to adopt the 2017-18 budget in the amount of twenty-four million one hundred five five hundred eighty-five dollars. <coughs> which is reduced by estimated receipts and available funds in the amount of two million nine hundred and thirty thousand dollars and nine hundred and thirty thousand one hundred and fifty two dollars for a net amount to be assessed to the member towns of twenty million one hundred and seventy five thousand four hundred and thirty three dollars this assessment is comprised of twenty million one hundred and forty nine thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars in operating expenses and one million twenty five thousand nine hundred and sixty seven dollars in debt expenses and that the treasurer be authorized to certify this budget in the apportioned share of each town based on the statutory method can you repeat the assessment number Matches what's in the but overview. Operating <coughs> and debt. Right. Got it. Okay. Yep. Did you want to stay long? So. so moved. Okay. Second. Mm -hmm. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead. I would say <laughs> I'm. I'm still not comfortable that our operating expenses are increasing at a pace that's over 5% when we know at least one of our member towns cannot sustain that type of expense growth and the impact it would have on their assessment for any period of time. I mean, we're, we just seem to be extremely fortunate that the way everything worked out this year, we're projecting Sherborne's assessment to only go up 1.5%, but even the even the operating percentage component of that is is close to three percent and everything i've heard in meetings and conversations with advisory people is is there's the, the guidance they're giving us this year isn't going to necessarily change or improve or be more optimistic in future years um, and then we also had a very spirited um, set of input during our community comment section and I don't want to make any comments specific to the contract negotiation mm -hmm. I think that's appropriate for executive session mm -hmm. at this point still 
Mm -hmm. um, but that only raises my concern level. Okay. So I, I just don't, I'm not comfortable how we got to the final number, the use of E and D and the optimistic projections for, you know, the state delivering on a 20% increase in, in aid. So I, I still don't know whether I'm a yes or a no at this point. Okay. Any other comments? Can I ask a question? Uh, so, Michael, uh, if, uh, as, you, as you contemplate whether to do it yes or no, what would, what would you, what do you contemplate, <coughs> how would you contemplate adjusting the budget that you would be more comfortable with? I just don't see that we're really in an environment, a financial environment, that can support 5% operating expense growth. I mean, we're using E and D funds. We have changed our past practice around projecting state aid growth. Uh, we got a favorable shift in expenses from Sherborne to Dover based upon the changes in the, you know, in the allocation formula. The MLC changed also to shift dollars from Sherborne to Dover. It's just a series of of everything coming together to create a budget that we've heard that advisory is comfortable with. I just don't. And, and maybe we're comfortable saying, okay, this is this year and we won't worry about next year and we won't worry about how the contract comes out. But I just don't, I don't see how we can support 5% operating growth to just our, the underlying financial structure isn't, isn't there. Well, I, I think I am not saying that we can sustain that ad infinitum either. I think okay. that I don't think any of us are. I think that what we would look towards is with next year with Dr. Keo coming in to do some exercises to look at some of the structural things in our cost structure and figure out what might be adjustable over time that can really move the needle on some of these things. But I think that the, those kind of exercises around um, around many areas are not something that we're going to do in the next few weeks. And therefore, I think that I feel comfortable with the budget that we have now being, yes, I, I understand your concern about revenues, but that would just exacerbate the percentage if we, if we decrease that. Um, and I'd like to see us go through the exercise over the upcoming year on things that can actually really move the needle on the budget. And that will be, to me, how we get away from a 4.58% a increase year to year. When can we have another conversation that's an executive session that addresses the compensation issues that are in front of us? Because that's part of, I just feel hamstrung. I, I, there are other comments I'd like to make, but right, it's just but not, it's not appropriate for where we are and, so and our process, even though part of this process has suddenly become very public in, in ways that I, it's new to me as a school committee member. So we will have a look at when, when to put an executive session to talk about. Yeah, because I, I mean, what would happen, I just, Again, it's hard to vote for a budget not even knowing what we would do in some scenarios of how the contract would turn out. And I haven't heard anything. Right. And I understand, I, Michael, I understand your uncertainty about that. But unfortunately, the budget process and the legal process about town meeting and voting for the yeah. budget is going to happen regardless of when the negotiation process is over. Um, and I, I do think the administration and um, Others have done a great job trying to um, continue providing the services um, and maintaining our facilities that are expected by our constituents, our students, our parents, and for this year. It's, we're, we're voting on this year. We're not voting on five years. Well, but you we're making decisions like adding a resource room that has a, a permanent Mm -hmm. multi-year impact in fact a growing one so I, I don't think I don't I just don't buy into the fact that each year we can go like this and only look at the implications of this year and then we'll 
have a prayer on what will be next year. Um, will we be having either a regionally based executive session or a joint executive session before Sherborne's um, and Dover's town financial committee public meetings? I don't have the date. I know there is a joint meeting, I think, on the calendar for April 11th. But, but one that's, that would work with our budget cycles because I, I do feel like, again, this morning, this after, today's meeting didn't give me a warm fuzzy on how this is going compared to past negotiating no cycles. Michael, when is, when is the Sherburn advisory? Uh, March 18th. March 18th. March 18th. 18th. We have a meeting on March 14th. Yep. Just have the region not join. Not everybody, but. right. So we'll have some offline discussion on that. I guess I would, I would say only in, in response to one of your good points is that um, this is the high water mark. This isn't necessarily where we come in uh, finally as information uh, you know, comes out, comes in. Over the next month we have a chance to adjust it if we don't think we are going to be safe where we are. Um, my experience has been I've been told these are high water marks Fair. and we have the vote and suddenly all discussion no, no, and activity and so Fair. so I'm less you know without any any rich conversation about what our other options are if we were in that place already happening makes me feel like what we're voting on is what we are committing to for resources for next year but at this time we have right. no additional I mean, information there's no so activity going on in part of the central office to to propose anything alternative to a 20 point you know four million dollar right. budget 21.14 one, 24 right so are we ready to call for a vote mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, those in favor of the motion on the table? Aye. Okay. Opposed? Thank you, Michael. Okay. We also, um, I believe, need to have a motion to utilize E and D. And I'll invite that motion for the fiscal year 2018 budget okay. shall include $137,290 as of the June 30th, 2017 certified excess and deficiency to reduce assessments. So moved. Thanks. Uh, further discussion? Those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries on both counts. Um, consent agenda? which is the approval of the minutes of February 16th, 2017. Any comments? Only that they need to spell Mr. Kellett's name right in the top. Okay. Um, and I will invite a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Michael and Richard, first and second. Those yep. in favor? Aye. All in favor? Can I ask one question? Before? Definitely. <laughs> <coughs> Technically, I think we missed your window. <laughs> on the um, uh, the budget presentation, yeah. out at the end, there was this thing about involvement. I, I don't need to be walked through this, but I do look at the projections going out to 2022, 20, 23, and note in those last few years, there seems to be this extraordinary fluctuation from year to year, where we're down 42, we're up 55, we're down to 47. Is there anything other than just wacky modeling going on here for some reason to think that these numbers mean something like that? They're reflective of the grades below and yeah. what those numbers it's are. Just so, so somewhere in one or the other, combined both of the schools down in the elementary this month, there's some extraordinarily small class bumped up against some extremely yes. large class. Exactly. I'm sorry, where do you see it going up and down? Uh, <coughs> the, the regional projection <coughs> columns. 
So Richard, it's probably at the elementary school when the housing market started to move. I, I just see it going down. It goes down. 727 to 1082. Oh, yeah. 1082. Yeah. 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 Yeah.